Next up, uh, Thomas Uphill is going to talk about Git and our 10K, uh, automatic environments, and kind of give a, an introduction to that. We're really excited to have Thomas here. He has been a great aspect of the local community here in Seattle. How many folks have been to the Seattle Puppet user group, even once? Okay, well, this is a great opportunity to change that number of hands. Um, so I'll let Thomas mention it, but there's a puppet user group right here in Seattle. Puppet camps are once a year, but getting together with other puppet users to learn from each other does not have to be once a year. Um, so you have the opportunity to meet with each other again, to learn from each other on a regular basis, which I think is fantastic. Um, and so I'll let Thomas talk a little bit more about that. Thank you, Thomas. Hello, everyone. Um, so as Kara mentioned, uh, one of the things I do locally is um, Pugs. And Pugs was started by Andrew, who's in the front seat. Yeah. Woo! Or Andy, you probably know him as Andy. Um, and if you don't know Andy Parker, this is, this is also the last time you'll get to see <laughs> Andy Parker as well. But Andy Parker... My um, wife's like, why is the last one? Just say, oh, no, this is the last time, that's it. <laughs> He's getting hit by a bus on the way out of here. Um, so Andy actually worked at Puppet Labs for two and a half, maybe three years. And he was one of the main contributors to the language uh, all the way from the two, seven, six to three something. Three, seven, four? I think it was three, seven, four. Anyway. Um, so if there's a lot of stuff in the language that you didn't think was really cool or you just hated, that guy right there. But um, he started Pugs and he was the only one here and we kind of grew to maybe 30, 40 regular members. I think last, I looked last night on Meetup, there's 247 people registered to the group. So if you're looking for people to talk to about Puppet, you know, you have a problem, it's a good mailing list to send to. So that's one thing I do. The other thing is this. They sent me a shirt to make sure that I got this out. Has anyone heard of Lopsa? Yeah. Really? OK. Uh, how many people are sysadmins? Well, you should have heard of Lopsa then, because <laughs> it's the League of Professional Sysadmins. It's the professional organization for system administration. You might have heard of Sage, which was the Usenix thing. Um, those two are actually coming back together, but Sage kind of went away and lost it, took over for it, but the two of them are working together again now. So if you're interested, you should look up lopsa.org. But the other thing I do, oh, yeah. put it on there, is um, say, uh, SASAG. So SASAG is the local chapter of Sage and Lopsa. So it's a combined thing. So if you're interested, look up sasag.org. So that's, that's my shameless plug for all that fun stuff. If you're a sysadmin, you should go Windows, Linux, you know, Mac, whatever. We doors are open. Uh, this year, we're probably going to have to find a new location. So if you have a location, let me know too, because our previous uh, president stepped down. Anyway, uh, I currently work at Wells Fargo, so I'm a uh, Puppet developer there. Uh, I've been using Puppet for probably about five years now. I mean, basically since it started. Uh, I wrote two books on Puppet right now, too. You might have seen them out there. One's Mastering Puppet, and the other's the Puppet Cookbook. So if you have them, I'm willing to sign them, too. Throw them uh, so that's enough about me. Um, I am a bit of a puppet evangelist. And if you want to hear more of that, just come to the uh, pubs meetup, which uh, the next one's going to be in July. OK. So if you want to get the slides, uh, I use Google Docs for just about everything. So that's the URL to go and grab them. I will leave it up there for at least 30 seconds. And then take a picture or whatnot. And I'll probably just tweet out that after the talk. All right, and I probably should have started my timer, but it's good. <laughs> you got plenty of time. One second. OK, good. Come on. Come on. Oh, you clicked on the wrong thing. OK. So um, a lot about how this is going to work with Git and R10K is talking about code. So I'm going to spend maybe about five minutes just explaining what the code is to start so we have a nice level playing field. Um, in Puppet, when you're talking about a machine, you're going to be talking about a node. A node is just any machine on which you're going to run Puppet. And on that node, you might have 
certain things. We call them resources. So there might be a list of packages, um, some services that you want to start. Maybe those services depend on some files. Um, those files might be owned by a user, or maybe they have a group associated with them that isn't there that you need for that to work. So this is kind of that, role, that um, progression of how that works. But what if you had, say, um, two or three different things that were grouped together? So you had something, call it what you will, uh, like Apache or, or MySQL or something. So there's a couple services for that. There's some packages for that. There might be some files associated with that. You can see this is kind of getting separated here. We have some users, some groups. And what we do is we, we put those together into a module. So we call that a module. So on this particular node, I have three separate modules that work on different parts of the system. So how does this work logically? Um, classes, everyone's familiar with classes? I'm not sure how beginner we are in this audience yet, but uh, <laughs> classes is sort of the lowest level in Puppet, right? That's just where you put single resources or maybe a few resources. And then a module is sort of a collection of classes. And then a node is defined by having a bunch of modules on it. Now, as, um, as an aside, I'm going to move on. Yeah. So this is strictly an aside. Don't, don't get scared. But I mean, um, there's a really popular paradigm out there called roles and profiles. So has anyone heard of this yet? Yeah. Anyone using roles and profiles? Oh, sweet. All right, you're going to like this. Um, so the idea here is that you get your collection of modules which define like the things that you want to run, MySQL, Apache, um, you know, whatever you've got, um, Razor, I don't know. Think, think whatever it is that you're trying to manage. You've got a bunch of modules. And then you have those different things defined in a profile. And a profile should be one specific task, like um, our e-commerce web server is a profile. And then from there, we say, well, our node might have one or two different profiles, but we're going to have a role. And this role is going to be like a backed up e-commerce web server with you know, a SQL database. And then Every machine that gets that gets the same role. So that you basically, when you're defining a machine, all you have to do is say one thing. You just say, this is the role that this gets. Now, there's nothing special about that. That's, it's a module like any other module. But it's a way of thinking about it that makes it much simpler to define your nodes. Because then you basically just have a one-to-one -one relationship. You say, this node is this role. And any other nodes that have that role should be the same. So that's awesome, but it doesn't really work in, in large uh, organizations because someone will come along and say, yes, they're all the same except, yeah, and that's the problem, right? Except this one machine gets this thing that's a little different. And you can handle that. There's tons of ways to handle that. Um, an ENC, um, anyone heard of that one? I just threw out an acronym. Um, that's the external node classifier, and basically that's just a script that receives the name of the host that connects, and you can spit back anything you want. So you could send back some modules, you could send back some configuration like parameters, um, you could send back uh, the environment, well, anyway. You can, you can modify how the node gets its um, code based on what the ENC says. Um, you can also use Hira, so that, that's a really popular way of doing it, is basically putting all the exceptions for different hosts in the Hira data so that they might get something a little different than everyone else, but when you go to the nodes, they all have the same role. Because that's really the, um, that's why you're here, right? You're trying to make your whole organization into just a bunch of cattle, right? I mean, you've, you must have heard of this, right? Pets versus cattle? Yeah, okay. Good. And of course, what do you do when the cattle's sick? Sorry, PETA, but you shoot them in the head, right? Um, so that's the idea, is it's much quicker to just shoot the node in the head and bring a new one up if all they need to do is apply puppet to it to get it back where it was. So that, this is all an aside, but that's, that's sort of where we want to go. 
So how do we get there? Oh yeah, you can you can have your ENC fed from your CDB. Oh, there's one more thing I gotta put. It's a good point. I always mention this because there are some people still doing this. Um, so if you if you if you have a really big investment in LDAP, like Active Directory, for instance, um, you can actually have the ENC pull the data from LDAP, or you can actually specify LDAP as your as your external node classifier. So you could say that I get the get the data from LDAP, and there are. Plenty of places that are doing that. Like they'll have in the in the machine records in Active Directory, they'll have the role of the machine and any kind of extra parameters in there, so that that's their corporate area for all the information about the nodes. This is all an aside, though. Okay, so back to the code. So now that we know what the code is, we know that the code is modules, and it's also the high data. So with the, with the modules and the highway data, we can basically define how we want the nodes to look like, what we actually want them to be at the end of the day. There's a little bit of a problem here because highway data is actually data and you're supposed to have code separated from data. That's a really big paradigm in public, but we'll just, we'll just consider it all code for now. Um, so the code, where does it live? It really depends on the version of Puppet you're running. So, um, the manifest and the manifester, if this is new to you, let me know, but the manifest is like your site manifest. Um, the module path, so that's the path that Puppet looks through to find all the modules. So, depends on the version. How many people are running like three? A version of three? Okay. So how many are on 276 still? I must, uh, no one's ashamed? Come on, it must be. It's hard in a huge organization to upgrade. I'm sure there's tons of people on Tucson, and it's cool. Um, but four has been released, and four is out there. Um, it really depends on, the, on the, the version that you're using, where all this stuff lives. So you'll have to kind of tailor this to whatever you're using in your organization. The other thing that's really important is the environment. And I don't believe that Eric covered environments at all in the morning, which is good, because I got slides on that. And I'm loading. This is what you use for using slides as a service. Buffering. Why am I loading? I don't think it's Puppet's fault. OK. I like show anyway. OK. I've never seen that. Anyone else? That one's new for me. Okay. Whatever. <sighs> Environment, you say? Oh, you know what it is? I linked to a picture externally. I probably can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what do you think of when you think of an environment? And then here comes a picture of the environment. <laughs> Awesome. Wow. Okay. I'm just going to copy the picture next time. That's, that's not good. So is that what you think of when you think of environment? You already saw the joke. And no, that's not what environment means. Okay. Um, what are environments to Puppet? They're separate locations for the manifest and the module, module uh, path. So that you can have all of the code that defines your node in separate locations depending on what you call the environment. Now the environment by default is production. So if you bring up a node, you just install Puppet and you run it, you get production. That's fine. But what it's really useful for is like, anyone know SOA? He knows SOA. He knows SOA, okay. Um, Service-oriented architecture? Yeah, good. Um, SOA has this, um, this notion, and I think almost every company has this notion, but SOA has like the official defined, kind of ratified version of it where um, you have a sandbox area, which is where you get to just change everything at will. Um, you have a development area. You have a performance testing area. And then you have a quality assurance area. And all of these things happen before you get to production. 
So environments are really useful for that because you can basically go onto any node and say, okay, you're in Sandbox, pull my code from Sandbox. Or you're in the QA area, okay, you're gonna pull the QA code. So, let's see. This is kind of conceptually how it would look, right? I could have my own personal workspace. That would be the Thomas. Uh, I could then promote my code through to the testing area. After it gets through there, it goes into the development area and into production. And you know, make it work however it works at your company. I'm sure you have, please tell me you have something pre pro Yeah, I hope, okay. No, Facebook doesn't, but anyway. Um, they do everything live. They're very special. Um, okay, so back to locations. Uh, it really depends on what version you have, so I suggest you go back and, and run Puppet on your machines and use the config print. If you, if you haven't seen that, that's really, really useful. So if you just go on your node, your, your master node, and say Puppet config print module path, it should spit back all of the, all of the paths that are going to be searched for your modules. And by default, Puppet Enterprise had different locations than the open source. So I don't know if you could read that if it's big enough. These are the, these are the ones that are used. Um, for hybrid data, it actually is the same, so that's kind of useful. Um, that's the default. Obviously, you can set it to whatever you want. So in 3. Point something, actually, he's right here. Was it 3.4 or 3.6 when we got environment path? 3.4. Okay, so it's been around for a while, but um, environments were starting to get useful and people were really using them a lot, but it was sort of an add-on. And with the 3.4 release, they, they added this option for environment path where you could basically specify where the environments live, the path on the file system where they live. And this whole directory environments came out, so if you've heard of that, or if you go to Puppet Lab site and look for directory environments, you'll get more information on how this all works. Uh, those are the two for the three series. So the open source one uses Etsy Puppet environments, but the PE one used Etsy Puppet Labs. Um, and then the base module path. So how this works is um, the base module path is searched first, and then it looks for everything that's defined in the environment path. So the idea being that if there's a module in your organization that you want to make sure that no one can mess with or override, because in Puppet, it's really easy to override. You just make your module come first in the module path, and Puppet stops at the first match. So, you know, if someone has some really cool compliance module, and you just call yours the same name, then their compliance module's gone. Not that I'm telling you to do that. Okay. So, in 4, 4 was released April 12th or so, maybe? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, there, was this, there was this big push to get everything organized a little bit better, because right now, it seems like you saw, it's kind of a mess where everything's all over the place. There is this directory called code create. So all of the stuff that you're going to mess with, all of the, the code that you're going to put out there is going to be in this code directory. All the higher data goes in there. Um, anything for like the node classifier is going to go in there, and then your modules. And the base module path, yeah, the base module path remains where it was before. So, directory environments. Um, each directory within the environment path becomes an environment. So if you specify foobar as your as your environment, it's gonna go look in the environment path for a directory called foobar. Very simple. Um, it can contain your site manifest, so how you define your nodes. It can also contain all your modules. But how do you get the code into there? Um, how do you guys do this today? Do you just... <laughs> I linked to a picture again. All right. Um, so how do you guys get your code into that directory today? How many people are actually running Puppet right now like in production? people, okay. So you just SSH in the machine and put the code there? Yeah, sneaker net. So manually, 
Okay, it came up, so it's probably going to show the picture. Yes. So it's really not a good idea. <laughs> you really don't want to be messing around in that directory by hand. That should all be automated, right? Um, the best way to do it is Git. Everyone's familiar with Git. Got some nods, okay? Because they're going to do like three, four slides on Git because that's it's in the title of the talk, so that's a legal use of slides. Um, who um, who was it named for? Yes. He said he named it after himself, just like he named Linux after himself. Um, only the people that are from Canada or the UK might understand the reference. I don't know. Yeah. Um, a, git, a git is kind of like an idiot. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's a bit of a slang he's using there. Um, why did they develop it? That's also kind of a bit of trivia that's interesting. Back up. Yeah. Um, BitKeeper, BitKeeper was what they were using up until that time. And then BitKeeper decided that there were 10,000 people using its product and they weren't making any money. So they decided to put some licensing on it. And he's the perfect guy for the job, right? He's a bit of a jerk. He, he went, fine, I'll just do it in Bash. And he did, like, in the same day. He basically just rewrote BitKeeper in Bash, and then Git grew out of that. So um, why does Puppet use Git? Um, because the original model had cheap branches. That's, the, that's like the big thing. Branches in Git, so I think, yeah. Branches in Git are really just a reference. And references are hashes, which are computed really quickly. So branches basically cost nothing. If, you're, if you want to make a branch in Git, it's really easy. It's really quite simple. So that really helps us with our directory environments. This counts against my time, which is good, because I have tons of time. <laughs> I've never even seen that little triangle. Wow, that's terrible. OK. Anyway. Oh yeah, there's, it's, it's actually quite cropped. There's quite a bit of screen down here. I'm really hoping that none of my slides bleed off. But we'll see how it goes. Um, so let's say we have a bunch of branches within our Git repository. Um, these are the three that I would use. Um, what we want to do is have those branches created as directories in the environment path. Oh, I know why this is. It's coming, OK. So how do you get the branches to the directory. Uh, hooks, yes. Um, so Git has this notion of hooks. Um, Git hooks are just scripts, basically. Uh, they run at various points in the interaction between you and Git. Um, but for our purposes, it's basically whenever you push the code to the repository, you can have it kick off a little script. Um, GitHub has webhooks, so if you're using GitHub, you can still you can still get away with this. You just have to go into the, the GUI and to find a webhook that goes and does the right thing for you. Uh, so a brief word on how Git works. Um, not at all an exhaustive explanation. The, uh, you basically have this notion of a client and some sort of um, mechanism to get your code from your local machine to the server. Now, a Git server doesn't have to be a separate machine. It can just be another directory on your machine, and that's something that's very different from uh, other uh, version control systems out there, like Subversion. Probably a few people using Subversion, right? Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, I mean. <laughs> It's fine, but it doesn't have these really cool things that we need for Puppet. Um, so basically, when you're taking your code from your client machine, your local repository, and you want to push it up there, that's going to trigger um, two, two um, hooks that apparently you can almost read, uh, the pre-receive hook and the post-receive hook. For this talk, I'm only going to be using the post-receive hook, and I'll show you what that code looks like a little later. Um, I forgot something that he brought up, but 
Um, version control was listed as one of the top or key? Top. We'll say top. It was one of the top indicators of a performing IT organization. So if you have version control, you're going to be one of the top performers. And there are obviously a lot of people out there who don't have it. So that would be something to take back to your company if you don't have Git right now. Like, so, um, for a server, in our, in our case, because we want to mess with those hooks, we're going to be using this git init dash dash bear to set up whatever the server location is going to be. Because that will, that will basically clone or create a git repository that doesn't have a checkout of the code. It's basically the back end of that. So it'll create um, a directory that has hooks in it as a directory, and in there will be all of the scripts that we are going to play with. And we'll, we'll show those in a bit. Um, when, we wanna, when we, on our machine, locally want to play with that code, we do git clone to that location. And then when we're done with our changes and we want to put it over there, we do a git push. So these are the, this is the, basically, mechanism that you want to have. And you would have this set up in your organization so that that server would be probably on its own machine or possibly even the puppet server, that's, that's acceptable. Um, but everyone would have a local copy doing the git clone on their own workstations and then they would just push it up to there. So, uh, you write your module up in the dev, you update it in dev, and you don't affect prod. So if you work on the dev branch and you push it to the dev branch, nothing happens to prod, it only happens to dev tell your nodes that they're in the dev environment, and they don't know anything about what happened elsewhere. So, um, how, do we, how do we specify a bunch of dependencies? So let's say you've got, anyone familiar with the forge? Is this a new one? He did mention it. Um, you know, there's thousands of modules out there. There's the puppet supported modules. There's like standard lib is a really big one. If you haven't heard of standard lib, you should look there because most of the stuff that's missing from the core language is in standard lib. So <clears throat> we need a mechanism to be able to pull those modules from the forge and stick them into our module path. And a bunch of people looked at this problem and the thing that was come up that, that was the solution basically was this notion of this special file, the puppet file. And what it was developed for was this other product called Librarian Puppet. Um, you've heard of Librarian, maybe? No? It's a Ruby thing. It's good fun. It's not. It's a chef thing. It's a chef thing. Yeah. That's okay. He's high me. Um, basically, it's used to automate um, the module download. Has anyone used the module download facility of Puppet? OK, so if you haven't, that's something you can do. You can just, you know, when you're on your master, go Puppet module install and then give it the name of the module and it will go to the forge and download the module for you and stick it in your module path but this tool automates all of that fun stuff for you it can also pull from a git repository for you so we can do the git clone for you so we're going to look at the format of this i'm going to look to see if it's readable okay can you read that in the back yes. all right i made it big enough um, so let's go through this real quick. You can specify where to find the forge. This is the default, so you don't even have to specify this. You could have left it off. But there, there are some companies where you know, they want to have their own forge internally. So you can do that. You can fork the forge internally and grab everything. And that way you have the ability to approve modules that get included in the forge. Um, and then each one of these mod lines it's going to be a different module that I want to install into my module path. Um, so this one right here, I'm going to be pulling this from the forge. I'm going to pull the standard lib. And then right here, I'm going to say, I want version 4.1. For Apache, I'm going to actually pull it directly from Git. And because I didn't say anything, I'm going to get the latest in master. Or technically the default branch of that repository, but it's probably master. Um, for, for the apt, I actually, I could specify a reference. And by reference, we mean I could specify a branch 
I could specify a tag. Anyone using GitHub Enterprise or GitHub for this sort of stuff? Okay. So you could also put a release in there because releases and tags are synonymous, right? That's how GitHub um, handles tags. So that guy comes from the fork, that guy comes from Git, but it comes from a specific branch. So what's going to happen is we're going to pull that module, standard lib, and we're going to stick it in the modules directory within the directory that we created for the branch that we're working on. We're going to do the same for the Apache, and we're going to do the same for the apt. And then obviously because we're cloning the whole environment, we'll get the puppet file and whatever other files we have in our control repo. Has anyone heard that term before? That's sort of becoming popular. Um, it's basically the, the name that people give to the repositories that hold the puppet files that are basically in control of the module path. So, uh, Librarian Puppet was pretty good, but um, Adrian, who, um, Adrian Lebeau, here we go, um, who uh, works at Puppet Labs, took that idea and kind of took it to the next level and created this tool called R10K. And in 3.8 of Puppet Enterprise, that was rebranded as Puppet Code Manager. So if you're an enterprise customer, you now have R10K out of the box. It's included, it's a, it's a fully supported product now. Um, they've also started paying Adrian to work on it, so he's pretty happy about that. I think he even has two people working for him on it now too. I mean, it's, it's a big project. Am I lying? No, it's true. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. RTK is a piece of code manager. Yeah. yeah, the first piece. Of it's the first piece of code manager, and in the future, they expect to add other things in there. That's probably better. Okay. Um, it's basically an enhancement of Librarian Puppet, which was an enhancement of Librarian. Um, it uses the Puppet file. It overwrites the modules directory, wherever you are. So if you're currently sticking your modules in a, in a subdirectory called modules in your repository, well, it's going to blow it away. So you need to move them out of the way. That's sort of a take home little note there. Uh, and then this is a, that's a repeat. But the primary purpose of, so the, um, the configuration file for R10K is this R10K.yaml. Um, most of the time it's Etsy R10K.yaml, but if you're running 4.0, it's um, Etsy Puppet Labs R10K, R10K.yaml. Yeah, I think so. Pretty sure. If you're running 4, good job. There you go. Yeah. Probably no one is. Um, so that's an Etsy R10K.yaml, and what that does is it specifies where to go and find these control repos that we're talking about, and also where to cache the, the, um, the repositories. So the way that R10K, the thing that makes R10K really kind of useful more than Librarian Puppet is that it handles all the communication with Git or the Forge. It goes and it downloads those modules and it sticks them into a local cache directory. So that every time you go and reference them, you're not actually going out and grabbing it every single time from a remote location. It's getting it from that local cache. So that's, that's how R10K kind of makes it quick to do these sort of operations, because it's just copying things locally. So here's, a, here's a, an example, R10K.yaml. Um, like I said, I specify that cache directory. And then I have this sources. And this identifier here, a lot of people get confused, but that's basically meaningless. It's just a separator. It's just, you know, I'm calling it whatever I want. So um, I know there's a lot of people that call it plops, and I have no idea who started that, but it's really quite funny because it just propagated across the internet because no one knew what it meant, so they thought it has to be plops, it has to be plops. Um, so you'll see that a lot of places. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, you specify where to get the repository. And this is the important thing, is you specify where you would like R10K to drop the code. So basically, what this, what this file is going to say is, go and grab that repository that I have. And I could have had like a, a URL there. I could have done git colon, you know, slash slash, some git server. I could have had that. But I'm, I'm going to be working with a local one. 
Buddhist demo because clearly I have connectivity issues. Um, and this is where it's going to put that code. So it's going to it's going to go into this directory, into whatever branch, and it's going to stick all this junk. So um, this is a repeat. Sorry. Ah, that's why I did that. Okay, never mind. It's not a repeat. Um, in the 3x series, the environment path comes from the puppet.conf file, but in the 4 series and the 3, 6, 3, 6 and above. It's got to be 3, 6. Yeah. If you're using directory environments in 3, 6, 3, 7, 3, 8, that kind of line, you can specify this environment.conf file. And the environment.conf file goes in your repository at the base level. And in there, let's see, did we talk about that? Um, in the environment.conf, <clears throat> you can specify the module path and the manifest directory per environment. So that's, that's a huge win, actually, if you're on 3.4 or you're on 2.7 or something like that. Because now you can actually have the module path be different per environment. And you can also have the, the, the site manifest different per environment. So you can go and you can test things in different places. And you can tell me. I think it's 3.7 where I'm allowed to say future parser in environment. Yeah. 3, 8, 3, 8, oh, only in 3, 8, never mind. Um, if you're running 3, 8, this file also supports the ability to put the future parser on per environment. So that's, that's going to be really cool because you'll be able to turn on the future parser. Who's familiar with the future parser? No one. Okay, I will tell you what the future parser is. Um, he did it, right there. <laughs> um, the, the version 4 of the language is going to be a lot different than the 3 version. It's going to have a lot of extra things in it. And the parser of the language had to be changed to account for that. So basically, in, in the earlier 3, 6, and above series, an option was added to puppet.com where you could say, use the future parser. Basically, use the 4.0 version of the language to compile my manifests. So in the 3.8 version, we're allowed to specify that per environment now. Another reason to upgrade. Okay, so let's look at a more advanced example here. And this is, this is, this is probably going to apply to probably only about 15% of the audience, but we'll do it. Um, let's say you have a crazy shop where you've got a bunch of people who have control repos. Like you've got three or four different teams, and each one of them has to be able to specify their own modules, their own manifest, or their own site. Um, R10K actually supports that since version 1.5 something and above, or no, 1.2 and above. 1.5.1 is the current one. Um, this prefix option. So this is really kind of cool. Um, what this does is because I specified that the prefix is true, both of these, these sources have the same environment path. What it's going to do, let's see if we have a good slide on that. There we go. It's going, to, it's going to take that identifier that I put right there, so dev and QA, and it's going to prefix it on whatever branches it creates. So basically, it's going to create dev underscore and then whatever branches it finds in that repository. So then, your two teams, all they have to do on their, on their nodes is specify the environment as dev underscore and the one they want, and they'll get their code, and the QA team will get their code. So you have this ability where the two teams can work in the same environment path, but their code never touches each other, which is kind of cool. Um, I've seen a couple places where they'll also, what they'll do is in the environment.conf, they'll also specify some sort of common repository that everyone gets to use. Because, you know, you, shouldn't, you should probably try to work a little bit with other teams, maybe, once or twice. Um, so how hard is it to use R10K? Um, pretty much this is all I ever do with you. 
Uh, you basically just tell it, I want to deploy, I want to deploy the environments, and this option right here just says, I want to use the puppet file. So that's, that seems pretty simple, right? I mean, you were probably thinking it would be a lot harder, right? Um, so, so how hard is it going to be to write the script that we'll put in that git hook that'll do that for us? Okay, well, it's just going to be that. I mean, it's really not, not a hard script. Um, and honestly, I don't even think you need to do this part, but you might. Um, whenever a git hook is run, it receives three things from the, from the um, git client, basically. Um, and it doesn't even matter in our script. You'll notice we're not even using these. But we just we pull them in because they're there. But basically, all I do is I tell it, I want to run as a user puppet. I want to run R10K. I want to deploy my environments. And I want you to use the puppet file. That's it. So that's, that's how hard it is to get this to work. So this is where it's going to fall apart. OK. Demos, demos always work. Oh, wait, you know what? Questions before the demo. Yes? What, what does R10K stand for? R10K stands for nothing. <laughs> um, he, someone else will correct me on this, but he, he, for one thing, he didn't know about the Motorola processor because that's, that's an R10K, but um, he was thinking of something in anime. No. No, she's got it. It's uh, R9000. The next episode of the Puppet Podcast features Adrian Thibo talking about the origins of R10K. Listen in, folks. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, just do that. But <laughs> something to do with R9000. That's yeah. all I remember. He saw something in R9000 and he thought, I can be one better. Anyway, but do that instead. Uh, Blog.puppetlabs.com? Maybe? I don't know. I'll just repeat what she says. Oh, yeah, just tell folks to listen to the next episode of the Puppet Podcast. We'll cover it all. Listen to the next episode of the Puppet Podcast. They will cover the origins of the name and hopefully a little bit of the tool. <laughs> um, yes, sir. So, where are you running the RTP process? Is that on so where am I running the R10K process? That will be running on my master. Now, if you have a distributed master setup, it's run on each master. Matt. OK, I'll make this short. Uh, when you just run a deploy environment, it's going to take every branch and create the environment for it. Is there a way to do, essentially, like a git ignore for R10K where it can uh, specific branches, or do you need to target each individual branch? Okay, the question is basically, every time you run R10K, it's going to go to the repository, and it's going to do it for every single branch. Is there a way to specify which to ignore certain branches? No. <laughs> but it's open source, and you could probably fork something there. And, um, there's no actual cost to doing it, but I understand why you would want to specify. And honestly, it hasn't come up that often where I do want to just do this one environment. But um, because it's pulling from that cache directory, there's really no, there's no um, cost savings in doing that other than if you are worried that maybe someone updated something else somewhere that they didn't want to go out. I'm guessing that's probably, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, more questions. More questions, more questions. OK. We're going to give this a shot. There you go. Um, OK, so it's clear. Clear, please. Let's clear them all. Make sure they're clear. Hope I'm not losing anyone on the use of the word clear. Okay. Um, let's start at the beginning. Um, so I have I have a puppet server here. Um, I'm going on the bleeding edge. This is 4.1, so this is good fun. Um, I've created a Git user. I have created a directory for that user. Um, we'll call it her for fun. 
Um, and she has this repos directory. And in that repos directory, she has these three Git repositories. And in each one of these, these were cloned with dash dash bear. So if you're not used to seeing this, this is what it would look like. Um, basically, in there, there's going to be these directories. So the various branches that I have to find, they're going to be in there. Uh, obviously, you can control. Nothing there. Because uh, I only have the master branch in this particular one. Uh, and then in the hooks. So let's go to, let's go to control. Go to hooks. Okay. So here's all the hooks. You'll notice that everything has sample because they just those are just the ones you get by default whenever you do the the bear um, in it. But I do have a post receive, and that post receive is currently a symlink, so this could be fun. Oops. Okay. And it's pointing to my R10K one. Thank goodness. So this is my script. It's got a bunch of stuff it doesn't use because this is the only thing it actually uses. It's that one last line, like I said. So basically, whenever I whenever I uh, push to this repository, this script is going to run. And I also have I also have the highway data one. And if we have time, we'll go into that. But that has a different. So you see. Again, obviously a very short script. Um, so let's, let's get that off the screen before it confuses too many people. Okay. So this is my laptop. The, the Git repositories are on that Puppet server. We're in we're in the Puppet Camp directory. We're in Hyrule Data. So let's go let's go to that control repo. Here's the control repo. I've got that environment.com. I've got my Puppet file. And I've got a puppet camp directory and a manifest directory. We'll go to manifests. So here's my site.pp. Okay. Um, and basically, let's just do something like here. A word or a phrase. What do you want me to say? Come on. Come on. Squat. Which one? Go hot? Really? <laughs> <laughs> so, go Sonic and take the Mariners with you. Okay. So, um, sure. Uh, so, this should look familiar to everyone. Right? We added that file that we just modified. We're going to commit it. Okay, now what we're going to do is do the push, and this is where the live demo usually fails. So we'll just do git push. Okay, so what it did was it stuck it over on the Puppet Master in the repo's control. It went into the production branch. So now what we'll do is we'll go over here. This is the Puppet server. This is where it just sent it, right? I'm in the code directory, so I'm going to go to the environments directory. You'll notice that there's a production directory. It better be the same thing, right? OK. Um, if we go in here and we go to our manifests, and we look at the site.pp, we'll see that we put the GoHawks gay sports thing in there because R10K ran and it just grabbed that. So it's already done before you even knew it happened. So let's go back to this guy. This guy's talking to that server, so we'll just ask it what happens when we run a puppet agent. Yay, okay. So you can see that it picked up the change and we have it right there. So that's how hard it is to update your code in production. Nice. That's that's demo one. That's pretty easy, right? Okay. Good. Yay. <laughs> Any questions on that so far? Do you understand the, how this is working? I think? It's much clearer once you see the demo. The slides make it seem much more complex. Um, Let's go back. Oh, yeah. We can do that. Um, 
Although I don't know if my connection will, well, we'll just try it. Okay, so we're gonna go here. Um, so this is my puppet file. I have <coughs> standard lib and concat. So if I go back to this production directory, so let's go back, we're in production. Sorry, I won't do all that stuff yet. Um, the modules directory, what do we expect to see there? Okay, we expect to see that and that. And this is highly frightening, but that's what we see, right? No minus L. Oh, yeah, no minus L. Okay, there we go. Standard Living Yay! Okay, so let's go there. Let's do a new one. I always do that. Um, Actually, no. That that has a bunch of dependencies. It'll it'll make it'll take forever. Let's try that. No one's saying no. That does exist, right? I'm not making that one up. Okay, good. So let's add that. Taking longer this time. I kind of expected it to. Um, well, let's see if it's actually successfully doing anything. Um, and we'll see that it's in the home, get, reverse control. Oops. Good point. Okay. Uh, oh, it's that's right. I can't show you. Okay, never mind. We'll just go back to the directory because we've probably waited long enough. Yay! Okay, we waited long enough. Etsy, puppet labs, code, environment, production. Okay, modules. Okay, what do we expect this time? No. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, network, you couldn't find it. All right, well, that's the demo. Um, <laughs> and, and obviously a very good reason to have your own local internal forge. But the push action works. So oh, yeah, the code, the code got changed, but the... The, um, the thing that we were pulling from the forge, we obviously couldn't reach it from here, sadly. Um, so that works. So now, so, because so. I have time, I have five minutes, unless someone has, we can have a question, I can do the multi one too. It's up to you. Yes, the NTP module would have got downloaded there, but because I couldn't reach the forge, it didn't get there. Um, the nice thing is, because I did it right here, um, this is sort of an advantage over GitHub. With GitHub, with the webhooks, I wouldn't have seen the error. Here, you actually get to see if it failed, which is nice. Um, if you like seeing failure, which I usually do. Uh, so, you had something. Uh, I was going to ask, so if you could change your code to use the NTP module rather than just pull it in. Then it would fail. Then your code would be out of sync with the modules that yeah. So the question is, if I if I actually used the NT mon, NTP module at this point, my code would fail because the NTP module was not there. Always forgetting to repeat the question. Okay, so this is the multi-team version. So let's go in here. Um, <clears throat> first off, let's use git branch to see which branches there are. There's a master branch and a prod branch. So what I'm going to do it's going to be fun. Uh, I'll make one called Pops. OK. So we're in the, mod we're in the branch Hawks now. We're going to edit the site.pt. OK. 
We're going to modify that. Okay. And site. And we're going to commit it again. Now, we're going to be explicit because the place that I'm pushing this to doesn't know about this branch. I only made it locally. So the first time I do this, I have to tell it, I really want you to make this new branch for me. Do we call it Hawk or Hawks? <laughs> yes. OK. All right. And it's probably going to do the same thing where it tries to go to the repo and do it. Update the puppet file, and we're going to wait on that network outage. Um, but if we go now to here, okay, um, we're going to wait a little while. There it is. So it created this directory. You see, because I just made that branch, I just pushed that up. Now it's created the multi hawks directory. And in there, we're going to see what we just put. Right? Not bad. Okay, so let's go back to this guy. Multi hawks. So we're going to tell it that we wanted to use that environment that we just created. Oh yeah, that's right. That was part three where I was actually going to go in and modify higher data. Let's just let's just take that out. Did I edit it in the wrong place? I did, didn't I? Oh my god. Why did the rounds to me? It's very bad. Don't ever do that. Okay, let's do this again. Actually, the second time I shouldn't have to do that, but we're still going to have to wait on that network, network outage. Um, but basically, when we went into that directory, we saw that, number one, R10K created without us telling anything. It just knew there was a new branch out there. i got to make a new environment. So as far as automating your deployments, this is great because anyone on your team can then make a branch for themselves, and it just gets a whole new environment to themselves where they can mess around with the code and create you know, problems like this for themselves. But people who, people who are working on the production environment, they don't ever see that problem. They just go right back. So that's why, and that's why using R10K with environments like this is really useful if you have, say, more than one person working on Puppet. All right, any more questions? Glassy-eyed, awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul.